information that I'd love to share with more people than just my patients. I, I, I'd love to prevent people from becoming patients, and I really enjoy all the wellness activities that I get to do, so the, the Pilates and the TRX, and um, some of you have done running assessments with me. So that's it for me, basically. And tonight we're just going to go through um, a lecture that I've, I've spoken in San Francisco Marathon, I've done through UCSF, but I, I've updated it for you guys a little bit, and we're going to talk about some different things. So how many of you are currently training for something or running regularly? Yeah. <laughs> um, and when you're running, is running all you do, or are you incorporating other cross training activities and strengthening? And you're incorporating? Okay. Okay. Good. Well, sounds like we can all go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I, so I'm a runner too. I've been running since I was 16. Um, a good friend of mine got me into it, and I, you know, I'm not super duper competitive or anything, but I love doing half marathons. I've done a couple marathons. And what I found was I generally feel best when I'm incorporating the component of strength training, and I actually feel like I am running faster and more efficient. And guess what? The research supports that. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Um, I'm somebody asked me earlier what I'm training for. I'm getting ready to start my US half training, which is going to be a good mental challenge because I got really bored of that after my last marathon. Um, and I used to lead a community running group that Justine was part of, and that was fun just to share that education. So I think before we talk about why strength training is so important, I want to just hit on the basics, the phases of running. And so we can break it down very easily into three different segments. There's your um, initial contact, and some of you are going to, we'll have a little bit of debate about where that contact is. A lot of the hot topic right now is, is heel strength correct? Is toe touch or foot, you know, forefoot strike? correct or is it a midfoot? And I that may be a topic for another night, but wherever your foot lands first, that's considered your initial contact. And then we've got your absorption. And that's where your body absorbs all the forces and the, the impact forces from the ground. And then we've got swing. So that's pretty easy to imagine. It's when your leg is swinging through the ground. And I want to just hit on kind of the major muscle groups and what they're doing during running because they're always, all the muscle groups are working at all times, whether you're absorbing and impact or your legs swimming through the air. So quads are what we often think of as a major running muscle and a lot of us don't know how to turn off our quads or pretty what we call quad dominant. So the quads are most active from late swing, so when that leg is swinging back, all the way through to mid stance. Okay, so that's where that you, you've gone through initial contact and landed in mid stance. Um, they're preparing the limb for hitting the ground, and then they absorb a lot of the force. So we were talking a little bit earlier about returning to running and having those sore muscles, and that's those muscles starting to absorb the forces. And most of our other activities we do aren't, don't have a lot of forces. So cycling, there's not a lot of ground impact force. Swimming, no, no ground reaction force. So it's those quads that are really taking the bulk of that absorption of force and impact. Hamstrings, you might think that they pull the leg up and pull the heel, but their main role is to actually decelerate this part of the leg as you prepare to strike the ground. So they are eccentrically, meaning they're lengthening. So an eccentric contraction is a lengthening contraction versus a concentric contraction, which is a shortening contraction. We'll try not to use too much anatomy or terms. But their main role is here, to slow that ground. So that's why you can see a lot of hamstring strains in people, is that that muscle's not conditioned to slow the leg, and so people are overstriding, and lots of different reasons why you get a hamstring strain, but that's where they're really most important in running. Um, hip abductors, what do you guys do? Have anybody ever been a PT for a knee or a hip or a back or a foot injury? And what did they tell you? Probably, your flexors. Yeah, or you're, like you're kind of, yeah, tight hip flexors, which can inhibit kind of glutes. So the glutes are the hip abductors as they're collectively known, their role isn't to stand, and I feel like I've broken record today, I've said this multiple times, their role isn't to abduct the hip, it's to stabilize the opposite side of the pelvis. So when you land, you've absorbed the weight through the force through the quad, this muscle, this muscle group, is going to work to prevent a hip drop, because otherwise if it didn't work, you'd be running down the road with a <laughs> hip wiggle. And I, I watched women especially walk and do that, and I think they think it's so cute, and to me it just screams, <laughs> this is my mind, I think. Um, so yeah, basically they help prevent a level pelvis. Um, we want especially, it's funny that we're all women here right now, but we all kind of have this tendency to, to drop our knee inward or internally rotate, which can create a lot of different types of injuries, patellofemoral 
pain syndrome, you know, lots of different things, stroke anterior bursitis, IT band. So those glutes are also responsible for helping maintain that neutral alignment of the leg during running. Then we've got the calf. What do you think the calf's good for? In San Francisco, what's it good for? Climbing hills. Yeah, propulsion up hills. But probably more importantly, it's responsible for helping to control pronation. And pronation is not a dirty word. That pronation is a normal function of the foot to absorb energy before the coral quads have to take the bulk of it. But the calf helps prevent or slow down too much of that flat foot position. And it helps with push off, like when you're running up hills. I think one of the most common injuries for a new runner in San Francisco or a new San Francisco who's been a runner is Achilles tendonitis, calf muscle pull, things like that, but they're just not used to running up hills. I threw the core and the upper body in because we don't typically think of those as running muscles, but I think you're all smart enough to understand that the core is an important running group. And when I'm talking about the core, I imagine that I'm chopping off my head, my arms and my legs, and I'm left with my core. So it's not just my abdominals. It's, I actually consider my pelvic core, my glutes, my back muscles, my diaphragm, my pelvic floor, so those deep internal muscles, those are all muscles of the core. Um, they actually help with the transfer of force from the lower body and upper body, and they help provide a stable base from which those muscles of the legs we just talked about attach. So if you've got stability here, these muscles that propel and absorb and slow down movements have a better line of pull because they're not trying to control a sloppy pelvis. Um, and then upper body. Do you, when you guys are doing strict training, do you include upper body? Do you only do upper body as a combo? Do combo, okay. Yeah, and some core, big core stuff in there too. Yeah, and if you think about it, the upper body, a strong upper body can give you more power. Um, and it can just keep you moving down the road a little bit faster. So I think kind of knowing the major muscle groups helps us think about how we would craft a program. So what is strength training? Marta? <laughs> Pretty interactive here. Do you want the, uh, do you want the uh... Like the Webster's, the, the Merriam-Webster dictionary definition. Strength training is uh, moving a muscle through some resistance, right? Yeah. And it's full range to make it stronger. That's right. Basically. Right. It's working against resistance to create a muscle contraction with the idea of developing strength, endurance, um, and, and hypertrophy of the muscle, making bigger muscles. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what are the other benefits of strength training? And these, I mean, you guys know these. I don't have to tell you, but I'm going to tell you. So it actually helps increase endocrine and immune function. And a lot of endurance athletes, people who run a lot, cycle a lot, their immune systems are actually suppressed. So that strength training helps support that. Uh, helps maintain muscle mass. And an interesting thing was I could not find a legitimate statistic for when we actually start to lose muscle mass. I saw as early as the age of 20, which scared me to death, to um, we start losing 5% after the age of, every decade after the age of 35. So it's kind of, we know that as you age, you start to lose muscle mass. So how do you prevent that loss? You have strength training. I know, this is some why I, sorry. I'm not telling you anything new. The other thing that, great, but we have a crowd of women, bone density. And we have a crowd of, you know, women who need to start thinking about that. Endurance athletes and, um, you know, thin women, we all have this tendency of needing to maintain bone density. Do you guys think you have a history of osteopenia or process in your family? Yeah, you're that you're fair skinned and they kind of kind of fit, fit the type. But we know that weight bearing strength training exercise can help maintain bone density. Um, there's an old theorem, Wolf's law, that says um, bone is laid down in the direction it's stressed. So bone is you know hopefully continuing to form as you're stressing it with with the resistance. And for me as a PT, what I'm looking for is strength training helps correct muscle imbalances. And we all have muscles. We all have muscle imbalances. You show me a symmetric person, and I will. Retire tomorrow, I don't know what I'll do. But you know, for whatever we're doing, if we're sitting and working at a computer that's over here, if we carry a bag on our left shoulder, if we, um, you know, I have a patient today, she says she's a bartender and she can't use her right arm now, so she had to retrain herself to use her left. Well, you better believe she's got muscle imbalances from doing something the same way all the time. So, strength training can actually identify, you know, if you're working with a trained individual, identify the correct those muscle imbalances. So, for me, we talked a lot about uh, absorption of energy, and these are some really interesting facts that I always kind of hang on to. For me, a lot of it's about injury prevention. My bread and butter is treating injuries, but I would much rather educate and teach 
for a minute and raise, I don't want to, you know, I don't want you to come to me broke, and I want to help you, help you improve. That's what I do. Um, but if I can kind of get the word out, then you know, maybe we will have fewer patients one week. <laughs> um, so when your foot strikes the ground, it is a 30 millisecond time when you go through that, that absorption phase. And statistics vary, but um, that, you know, when we talk about absorption, it's kind of that mid stance, the so initial contact, then mid stance. 30 milliseconds from when your foot hits the ground to when you're in that mid stance. Five times faster than walking. So walking is kind of like, hey, you can almost feel the transition from when you touch to when you absorb. But in running, it's, it's 30 milliseconds, which is pretty fast. Some of that absorption reduces the force of impact, but most of it is stored in your muscles to help with propulsion. So it's virtually a good, a good thing you need it to move down the road. Most injuries to the body occur with repetition, and it's basically combining fatigue with the body's ability to repair itself. So I was, people always say to me, well, I've been doing this for years and I've never been hurt. Well, everybody has this threshold, and the body is in this constant state of breakdown and rebuilding, and if your activity or something in you exceeds the ability of the body to repair itself, injuries are going to occur. These were some interesting statistics. Achilles tendon, if any of you guys ever had Achilles pain? Oh yeah, I remember that. Achilles tendon forces have been estimated to be approximately six to eight times body weight in the Achilles tendon with, with running. And patellofemoral contact, so how your kneecap um, articulates or, or reacts with your femur, um, between seven to 11 times your body weight. So that, think of your body weight, you know, multiply that by 10, and that, those are the forces going through those joints. So, the other thing is, we talked about that five, 30 milliseconds between initial contact and mid stance. Most of the forces occur in the mid stance. So it's not when your leg is flying through the air that you're gonna get hurt. It's when you've landed and absorbed that you're more likely to become injured. And how much of the, what percentage of force from running do you think is absorbed at the knee? Your range, 10, 60? 100? 150. Plus 70 to 80% are absorbed at the knee. So that's why I think people are like, oh, running so bad for your knees. It's not. You just have to be prepared and ready for those forces. So I went into a lot of common myths with trying to get runners to strength training. Have you guys always done strength training? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, runners like to run. They don't want to be in the gym. They want to throw on their shoes if they remember to pack them on a business trip and hit the road and go run. They don't want to be stuck in the gym. They also don't want a lot of equipment. That's why running is such a great sport. You don't need a lot. So the big myth I hear is, I actually don't need to do strengthening because running strengthens my legs. How many of you have said that? <laughs> so running does help your legs, but it really helps with the endurance component, not necessarily the strength component. Um, and in, so we know that increased strength provides the ability to generate more force, which will power you down the road, more propulsion. Um, more absorption, we already took that that point to death, right? Quads help absorb the forces. So more bigger quads leads to better ability to absorb those forces impact. Stronger arm and muscle, stronger arm and leg muscles give you more power for running uphill. So thinking about where we live and the runs we have to do. And I like this statistic. So in older runners, when they look at older runners, let me make sure I've got this right. The stride rate doesn't necessarily change, but the stride length can shorten. So the number of steps they're taking per minute is probably on par with even a younger runner, but it's actually the length of their stride. It's more of a, I don't want to say a shuffle gait, but it's a smaller stride. So there's research that shows that strength training, strength training can help maintain that stride length along with a good program of flexibility training too. Questions so far? We're good? We're going to get up and move here in a minute, so um, don't get too cozy. Um, yeah, so the, the goal really of strength training in older adults is to maintain that gluteal strength to help the hip get back and then quadriceps flexibility so you can get this power. If the quads and hip flexors are flexible and the glutes are strong, you can get a little bit more power in your run and maintain that stride length. So are those really the two, oh, let me see, the two <laughs> sorry, priorities of strength training? Um, for running, like flexibility in the quads and strength in the glutes? Um, I would hate to simplify it that much. I think, yeah. I know, sorry. <laughs> but I did, in the, I'm going to give you guys a program tonight, and I tried to make this concise and comprehensive, 
and collecting all, you know, getting as much as we can in the fewest amount of exercises possible. So I think those are definitely goals, but there's other things too. And depending on you, there may be there may be other things you need to worry about. So strength and balances and things like that. So great question. Um, running running more will make this is myth too, by the way. Running more will make me a better runner. In your various training programs that you've done over the years, how many of you have done a six day a week run training program? We know that strength training in some form 
it's helpful. We just don't know, like Justine, there's not a perfect program. So there's so many variables, different body types, different you know, types of runs, um, too many variables. But I think that what we do know is that with strength training, you'll be able to run faster and longer. So, um, when you guys do your circuit training, what types of things are circuit training, strength training? Are you doing heavy weights? Are you doing more aerobic circuit training type things? What's the trend? I do yoga. You do yoga? Yeah. Awesome. So strength training comes in various forms. Pilates, yoga, TRX, weights. What do you guys do? Pilates. You do Pilates? Weights and TRX. Yep. Weights and TRX. Like you said. Revising this lecture, preparing, and um, doing that, I came across this blog post of this guy, and he was kind of um, bemoaning the fact that functional strengthening has become just way too popular. Why does everything have to be sports specific? That's just still how I think. Is and, and Justin and I were talking about this earlier. Like, if you want the body to do something, then you should train it in that way to do it. But there's controversy, and there's a difference of opinions, and there is no right answer. So. <laughs> If anybody tells you that this, this way is the only way, run. Because we all have different ways of doing things, and it's just kind of what works best for you and what feels best for you, as long as you're getting some, um, some muscle going. So we talk about different types. Circuit training, it, as you know, just involves short exercises at high intensity. We actually had our first circuit training class here last night, which was a blast. We had six people in 14 different stations, and we, everything was moved around. But heated this plate up a little bit. It's useful if you're kind of getting back in shape to help supplement that cardiovascular component. Um, and there was a study in 2005 in the British Journal of Sports Medicine that showed circuit training performed after running or endurance training produced faster 4K, 4K, I don't know, I've done that distance before, 4K results than endurance training alone. So that the, the question was, well, when should we do it? Should we do it before our run? Should we do it after our run? What do you guys typically do? Are you doing yoga on the same day that you're running, or are you doing off days? I mean, almost 100% off days. Off days, yeah. Just we actually kind of maybe yoga the day before my run, actually do feel better. Yeah. yeah. I think I feel more tired having to do it. Yeah. Well, and I think part of that is you've lengthened the muscles, and then you've fired up the core stabilizer, so you probably are just more powerful in your run. I kind of go back and forth if I, you know, I feel like you sacrifice a little bit of your strengthening if you run before, but you sacrifice your run if you strength train before. So it's kind of like, what is your goal for that specific workout? I found this study to be quite interesting, though, that if you do it after your run, this group actually had faster 4K four, four times um, than doing it at a different time. So when I think about developing a strength training program for runners, are all my runners on the same program? Absolutely not. But I typically will kind of you see trends in runners, you know, you typically see weak glute knees, you'll see short hip flexors, tight quads, um, you know, over recruitment of the quads, just different things. So you start to see these trends, what you have to be careful of as a practitioner is that you don't get blinded and only see those trends, because other people can present totally different things. Um, I identify the demands of the sport, I've already hinted at that a little bit, so I think sport specific, what are the, what does this person need to do their sport, whether it's running or cycling or golf or tennis. Um, I like to work in a closed chain pattern, and so what that means is that the, every muscle in the body works open chain and closed chain. Open chain would be like if you were seated on a leg extension machine and you were um, pushing the weight up by extending your knee, your foot is free to move. Closed chain would be your foot is fixed and your body's moving over that muscle. So every muscle does that, it's just where their line of pull is slightly different. So running is pretty much closed chain. I mean, you're always one leg, always up in the air, that's what differentiates running from walking. But that impact, I think we better you know, train that. Closed chain exercises also um, decrease joint compression forces by creating a co-contraction of muscles around the joint. In other words, when, my, when I'm in a push-up position or I'm in a squat position, Muscles on both sides of the joints are firing to provide stability and good joint positioning. Um, and then we talked about the core. We've already talked a little bit about the core and running helps with transmission of force, propulsion, absorption. Um, this is a really tough question too. And before I started working for TRX, I don't think I had I really thought much about it. Is there a difference between core strength and core stability? What do you think? 
or those two words synonymous? Thank you. 
And if the walking component adds too much complexity, or you have a you don't have a lot of room here in a hotel room, standing, you could do standing same side or standing alternating sides. I'm not gonna get too picky with that. Make it fit your environment. Side lunge to balance. Interestingly, quite hard. Okay. Side lunge to balance is side lunge, but then I, I like the reason I have you guys reach into the ground with some of these is it helps facilitate a glute contraction. So every muscle kind of has to go through a stretch before it can contract. So you can kind of feel the glute stretching as you lean forward. It tells the muscle, okay, you're going to contract, and then you're going to press up to balance. Ooh. Again, this is super hard even without a weight. Hard, huh? And here we're working dynamic balance. You guys can stand on your foot all day long if I just said stand on your foot. But running is almost a little bit of balance since you run down the road. Um, golf is balance. Can you do this one again? Yeah. That's not nice to see. You're just trying to figure out how to do it. Down. Yep. The opposite leg is going straight. And then so this contraction here, this stretch, prepares this leg to contract and pull you back up. So their legs are working together. And when you pull up, you just have to up. Yeah, I pull up just to <laughs> kind of get me there and pull that out. Got it? Your elbows stay at your side. 
I don't care so much about that. Um, what I'm looking for is just a recruitment of your lats. So even if you're keeping your elbows at your side, if you can draw them in a little bit more to hug your ribs. Did that feel harder, easier, or no different? <laughs> harder. Harder. So the, the, yes, some people say it's harder. Some people say it's easier and more stable. I think the first time I did it, it felt harder because I was recruiting muscles I wasn't used to recruiting. So the concept of, it felt the same. You should probably do it in that way already. The concept of pulling yourself towards the ground helps kick in a little bit of lat muscle tension. Lat recruitment maintains overall better core stability. So that's all I'm trying to do there is improve your lat, that's like recruitment, turn the muscle on. And then this also gives a little bit more lats. So it's just a more stable push-up. When you say pulling yourself to the ground as opposed to what? what else Letting yourself drop. It's just, it's more the cueing, like the verbal, you know Pilates is all about cueing. So it's like you're trying to resist or maintain some tension in that muscle as you lower. That's it. Okay. From there, we've got plank with row. This continues to be the bane of my existence. It's such a good exercise. So plank position. I advocate a wide base of support. You want your feet pretty wide. I don't think you need a weight for this, but you certainly can. And you're basically trying to resist the body's wanting to rotate. And we're going into a row position with her without the weight. And you feel how you just automatically want to rotate those hips. And you can do alternating arms, you can do same arms. Think about initiating the shoulder blades, please. No, just holding plank. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to do a single arm push up while you're at Good. So try to do that one more time and try to squeeze your shoulder blade before you pull your elbow straight back and let your elbow ride right against your rotation. Yeah. So imagine that you're doing like a standing row. That's what this is. A row is a scapular stabilizer exercise that's helping get the muscles between your shoulder blades strong. Good. And then press that ground right through your shoulder. So lift up here just a little bit. There you go. There you go. So it's working these scapular stabilizers as she's doing a motion with her arm, much like Betty, right? Okay. Does it matter if she's up higher? Yeah. Good, good question. Good question. I think that depends on 
on kind of the person's ability. So legs bent, you're going to be slightly regressed, and there may be if you're fatigued one day, you do it like that. Longer legs is going to be more progressed version of that exercise. Yeah. And I mean, we're doing a version of that with some of the other exercises we're doing here, but anything where you're holding your body weight up is what I'm looking for there. And when you say three times a week, what do you mean? I think, well, well remember that one study is it said two days, 32 percent of your training volume. So I think two to two to three times a week. Mm -hmm. Two times I would be thrilled. Three times I'd probably throw you a parade down the <laughs> <laughs> So if you can, yeah, two times a week, I think you're great. I actually I found tools that I like to, you know, I love, I love my gadgets, I love my TRX, and I, I like the Pilates a lot. Um, I like fencing balls, and so I tend to do it more often, but that's just me. And then, um, so say I'm doing Pilates. Yeah. Do I do this plus my Pilates? Good question. I would be interested to see you do it one time a week and Pilates one time a week, and just see what you think. Because mm -hmm. I think we get into this habit of, um, I know my boyfriend always says, well, I don't want to do that one. Well, yeah, because it's the one you need to do. It's the hard one, right? So we get in these routines where we all we always think our favorite exercises because they're what we're good at. They're what's <laughs> easy for us. So that's the same way. I don't know which ones I don't want to do because they're hard. So I think a, a mix is helpful. I, in a perfect world, I would probably do, in a perfect world, I'd probably do three days a week, um, two Pilates, one TRX, or two TRX, one Pilates. And I mix other stuff in. I don't think that these two things are the only tools out there. I do medicine balls, I do posu, I do weights. I don't do a lot of um, machines because they don't allow the body to move that well. And we want to. And you don't have them. <laughs> and I don't have them, yes. But that's why I don't have them, is because I don't think they're that yeah. awesome. And they can be a lot with your own body and so bag of flour or something. But that's I said so maybe the free motion was allowed. Yeah, that. free motion definitely.